with over 10,000 volunteers nationally. And we have expertise in any vertical industry you can think of and any vertical with regards to particular business um, needs that you might have, be it marketing, legal, financial planning, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, if you currently are working with SCORE and you have a mentor, reach out for an update or a business tune-up, or if you have a particular issue, bring it up with them and see if there's something we can do to help. If you don't yet have a mentor, you can click on any of, any of the, um, well, you actually can't click, right, because it's Zoom, but you can copy um, on any of the uh, chapters that are there. They're arranged geographically depending upon where you are. I think most of you are probably in either Northeast Massachusetts or in the bostonscore.org geography, but it doesn't matter. Click wherever you are and we will find somebody who can help you and help you to meet your needs. Um, Teresa, do you wanna take these? Sure, uh, we just want to encourage you. Uh, we do expect a large number of people on the call today. So we really want to encourage you to use the Q&A tab for any questions you want asked to the presenter. Uh, that way I don't lose track of those questions. Uh, the chat can be used for anything else. And in fact, if you'd like to introduce yourself in chat and um, tell what industry that you are uh, in or thinking of, uh, of joining, uh, we appreciate that. Um, that's all I have. Okay, so let's, great. Let's turn it over to Mark. Okay, so, Everybody see my uh, slides? Yes. Okay. Well, this morning, what we're going to talk about is business planning. And most of you, when you probably first heard the words business planning, your eyes rolled back into your head and you thought, oh my gosh, what am I getting into? Well, uh, we're going to talk about business planning in a simplified way uh, and using the business model canvas. And in doing so, uh, this is a way that you can look at where you are, what you're doing, how you're doing it, why you're doing it, and in a, in a one-page format. Uh, and the, the number one word I want you to remember as we talk today is verification. Because what this approach to business planning does is it helps you verify the assumptions you're making uh, in doing your business plan. So when we think about business planning, uh, I go back to a workshop I took about 40 years ago. And you know, they always say when you go to a workshop, you should expect to at least take one really good idea away and remember it. Well, this workshop was in California and it was conducted by Peter Johnson, who was a strategic marketer. And what he said was the importance in doing your planning is accuracy before momentum. And you're gonna hear me say this quite a bit throughout today's session, because one of the keys to an effective business plan is a philosophy called crawl, walk, run. And that is design your plan so that you are crawling until you've completely verified all the assumptions you've made in your plan. Then you can walk. And once you're walking and your, your business enterprise is stable, then you can run and you can take, take it off to wherever you think uh, it can go. But we wanna make sure that we are accurate at the beginning, that every assumption we make in our business planning is verified so that we do not go down a path in launching a business that has fallacious assumptions. And the fallacious assumptions means that they're wrong. They're great ideas, but there's no customer. They're great ideas, but no one will pay for it. So what we wanna do is use this concept of business model canvas as a way of thinking through what it is you're going to do, how you're going to do it, and first of all, why you're going to do it. Now, business planning is a way to communicate, whether it's a one-page plan or a 50-page plan. It's a way to communicate to your employees. It's a way to communicate to your investors. It's a way to communicate to your bank. I had a session last week, 
And the bottom line really was everything that it takes in order to be successful starts with effective communication. And a way to communicate to your employees why you're doing what you're doing, to your investors how you're doing what you're doing, and to your bank what the results you expect to achieve from your plan is all wrapped up in the business plan. But for you, it's a guide. It's a guide that'll help you get from point A to point B. I used to say that business is really how to get from point A to point B, identify what are the obstacles between point A and point B, and figure out a way to deal with them. Well, this is a guide that not only sets out what it is you're going to do, but a ways, it's ways to measure it. One of my co-mentors, Susan Chandler says, if you have an objective, you better say right afterwards, how are you gonna measure that? Because the way we manage a business is through our objectives. And what was the result in achieving that objective? So we wanna think about the business plan in answering two questions. Where do you wanna go? And how are you gonna get there? So where do you wanna go is your objective. How are you gonna get there are the strategies and tactics you're gonna use. Now the strategies are the what's and the tactics are the how. Many people mix them up and we're not gonna get into marketing 101, but think about this. If somebody says, I want to increase name awareness as an objective, one of your strategies might be to use traditional media. And the tactics may be buy some radio advertising, buy some, some newspaper advertising, get an article written about you in the local newspaper. So in your planning, you need to think about this as the roadmap to get from point A to point B. But the plan is only as long as is essential to convey the message. I've read 30 and 40 page business plans. And when I got to the last page where the financials were, I asked why wasn't this a one page business plan because it didn't hold together. There's no reason why it has to be 30 or 40 pages. It could be 10 pages. My wife and I ran our business for almost 30 years. And we had a two page business plan. And that business plan was reviewed quarterly because it was living document. It guided us to where we wanted to go. And being a living document means that it, you can change it. Business plans aren't cast in concrete. They have to be changed as the economic, political, geoeconomic, environments change. And many of you have all types of environmental trends that you have to watch in order to make sure that you stay on track. So it's a living document and it can be changed. Now the SBA has a great template, but the best template that I know of to use if you have to do a full blown business plan because you're seeking financing and you need to submit it to a, lend, a lender is through the Southeast Economic Development Corporation. And you can find it on their website. It's seed.seedcorp.com. And what you do is to go to resources right here and look for business resources and look for business plan right here. And click it. The value of this business plan is that not only gives you the, the categories that you need to write about, but asks you pertinent questions in each of those categories that allows you to write the document. So when we think about this, what I want you to think about is the business model canvas is what is the way to go to simplify your approach. Even if you're going to be looking for financing, it's a great way to start because it allows you 
to outline what it is you're planning to do and how you're planning to execute it. It's a tactical tool. It's a way of really looking at, in one page, everything that you are thinking about. It's a brainstorming tool. And when you're thinking about launching a business or expanding your business, brainstorming is a great idea. But then you need to take those brainstorms and verify them and validate them. So what it is, it's a detailed plan for operating your business. What are all the elements that you need to execute in order to operate your business? But the business model canvas really is the framework around which we create this plan that we're gonna to use to move forward. It's made up of nine blocks and we're gonna go through each one of these blocks so you can see how to use the blocks. But the value is that it's all on one page. And if you find that something is not validated, you can line it out and add something different. So the first thing you wanna do is look at your value proposition. You start here. What need, want, or desire are you going to fulfill? Then we move to, for whom are you going to fulfill it? Then we move to, how are you going to reach them? Then we ask ourselves, what kind of relationship do we want with our customers? So you see that one through four are all related to our customer, the outside. Then we want to do, we want to look at all the activities. And then do you, what partners or resources you need to execute those activities. And then we look at what's, what, is the, what are the revenue streams and how much will it cost? What is the cost basis? So then we can do the financial projections to assess, is it going to be profitable over a period of time? What kind of cash flow do we need in order to make it work? So this is the plan itself. So let me, let me uh, test you for a second. And here's a, here's a business model plan uh, canvas. And if I just read a few of these, put in the chat who you think they are, the company is. Platform to connect riders with drivers. Anybody have an idea? Right, already. So what we want to do is think in terms of the fact that the need, want, or desire, the need to connect riders and drivers, the need to get the easiest around, the want anytime, anywhere, a low cost luxury. Who's it for? People who need a ride. How are you gonna reach them? You have an app on your phone. So, and then what's the relationship? The relationship is a rating system. So you can see very simply, you can define why you're doing it, to whom you're going to do it for, and how are you going to connect with them? So let's take it one step at a time and go through and show you how to utilize this platform. The value proposition. What value are we delivering? Now, remember, we don't sell products and services. Our products and services are the conduit through which we sell value. The value that we are selling is a need, want, or desire. I need a new car. I blew the engine in my car. I want a new car because my car is 12 years old. I desire a new car because I just want a new car. So what need, want, or desire are you fulfilling? And you need to find out what need, want, or desire your customers want to have fulfilled. You need to ask yourself, so what's so compelling about your product or service that they will move from whomever they are buying from? And remember, every individual, every organization that you are selling to is already being serviced by somebody 
or some organization for the product or service that you are offering. So you need to look at what's compelling. And to whom are your customers? You need to know the, that, and we'll talk about that, that in a minute. You need to ask yourself, what gain or value are you creating? Because the gain is what they're buying. It's the benefit. Remember, people don't buy features. They buy the benefit. What is it that they are getting that they need in order to address the problems that they have? And they come to you with a problem and looking for you for a solution. So you're a problem solver. So when you ask yourself these questions, the most compelling question you've got to ask is, what's your differentiation? Because differentiation achieves what's called competitive advantage for you. When you have competitive advantage, you have a position in the mind of a buyer so they see no suitable substitute for yourself. So your value proposition is not what you do, but what is it, it you transfer to a customer that solves a problem by satisfying a need, want, or desire. So you really need to think through what it is that you are doing. My landscaper just doesn't put fertilizer on my lawn. My landscaper provides me with satisfaction to look out on a green carpet of grass. Makes me feel good. Makes me feel connected to the environment. Now, when we think about this, I want you to think a little bit differently. Because on the right is your customer. Your customer has things to do. Your customer has pains. I have big splotches of brown in my lawn. I have a pain. I can't stand it. I don't, for, I don't water my lawn, but I don't want brown spots. My landscaper has products and services that can help me and knowledge that can help me that becomes pain relievers for me. And that becomes a gain for your customer. So you need to think in terms of the, number one is the value that you are communicating, you're delivering to your customers that becomes the benefit for them buying from you. So if you take a look at Waze, that cool little app on your phone that gets you from point A to point B without aggravation, Ask yourself, what are their value propositions? Well, for drivers, it's beating traffic. I'm going to Boston on Route 6, and there's a clog at exit 3, whatever the new exit number is. I can't remember. It shows me that I can get off at exit 4 and take Route 6A around and get back, get to the bridge on 6A. It allows me to navigate anywhere. One time I had to go to a customer meeting in New Jersey and I put it into Waze and I left, went left, right, right, left, left, right. I got there. I got in their parking lot and realized I had no idea where I was because I was just listening to Waze, navigating me to where I needed to go. Provides me warning. Police ahead. Something's in the road. It provides me satisfaction because I don't get lost. I don't know about you, but I used to sit in the back seat of my family car and my father would say, I know where I'm going. And he had no idea. It's satisfaction because you get from where you want to go to where you want to be and allows you to find attractions. When my ways is on, I know where every single Duncan is. And the advertisers, it's relevant to the drivers. So when you think about your value proposition, it's the need, want, or desire that you are fulfilling. But next, what we have to do is ask ourselves, for whom are we creating the value? Because we need to know who our customers are in detail. Because when we think about the value proposition, we're designing it 
for the people that are going to buy from us. So what do they think, see, do, feel? How do they interact? What causes them to buy? Are they quality buyers? Are they price buyers? Are they reliability buyers? We also have to think in terms of who are they? Where are they located? What are the social, economic, environmental factors that define them, that enable us to reach them? Are they in a specific age group? How do they receive their information? So you need to clearly identify your target customers so you have focus. And those of you who are in business already realize and know that focus is very, very important, especially starting a business. You need to know if you're gonna open a hardware store in Yarmouth, what percentage of customers will come from Hyannis or Dennis, the, the adjoining towns, to this location. You need to know if you are focusing on seniors, boomers, millennials, Zs, what age group? What are their demographics? You need to define them as closely as possible in order to reach them. Well, Waze looks at geographic segments. They look at drivers. They look at drivers who become part of a community. And they also look at roadside businesses. Now, the third block we're going to look at are channels. Some people look at this, these as sales channels. I prefer to look at, at them as information channels. Because what we need to think in terms of is how are we going to reach our customers? We know that our customers, our new customers, our potential customers, even our existing customers, are already being served by somebody. And those organizations have reached them. So you need to know if you're trying to reach boomers, you're trying to reach people in the 50 to, seven, to 65 to 70. How, how do, where do they get their information? Do they read the newspaper? Are they online? Do they re, are they engaged in social media? You need to know how to get to them. You need to know how to communicate your value proposition so that they are aware. Now, I'm going to step back from this for a moment and talk about the buying continuum, because this is very important when you think about channels, you think about target audiences. The one thing that every enterprise has when they are opening their doors, or even when they're expanding or changing their logo or changing, repositioning themselves, as many businesses have, is that they are unaware of you. They have no idea who you are. So your first job is to get them from unawareness to awareness. And that might be through public relations. It might be through a social media blitz. It might be an advertising blitz. It may be getting a, a, an article written about you in the business section of the newspaper. It's to get you, the buyer potential buyer from unawareness to awareness. The next task is to get them from awareness to understanding. You open your business, you have a differentiator, you need to make sure they understand what your differentiator is. When you do that, then you have to give them enough information about you and your business that they believe what you're saying. When they believe what you're saying, they will try you. And if they like it, they'll buy again. If they really like it, they'll refer you. They'll give you a testimonial. So when we think about the communication channels, 
we need to think about the buying continuum because everyone, whether you're buying business to business, whether you're, it's a business to consumer, everybody goes through this process. You need to be able to communicate this value proposition so they say, aha, this is something different. This may be solving my problem. So understanding these channels is very important. And the only way that you are going to know whether your target market uses one form of communication or another is ask them. So you might have to do some focus groups. You might have to do some surveying to find out how do your target markets receive your information so that you can be there. So the channels for ways might be awareness, word of mouth, fee, a free app, fully featured. Or it might be advertisers. Now, let me tell you, I had no idea what Waze was. I was on my way with an associate to uh, a client's office I had never been to. I pulled out a map. My associate, you said, associate said, you got to be kidding me. Don't you use Waze? Word of mouth. And those of you who are in business know that word of mouth is still the most powerful marketing tool there is. I'll give you a, a, uh, an example. We have a new nonprofit on the Cape called the Family Collaborative. And what they do is provide meals for those in need. And I think over the last year, I, they provided over 100,000 meals. Every Monday night, they provide uh, food that people could come and pick up. Last night, they had salmon, Brussels sprouts, potatoes, salad, and soup. And you can go in and order and buy it and bring it home uh, for, uh, for your meal. An average of 60 to 70 people per Monday night do this. This is one of the ways that they raise funds. I'm a driver for them. And on Thursdays, I drive to the Council of Aging and deliver normally 120 to 150 meals. I was talking to my neighbor and I said, I got to go. I got to get over to the family collaborative in order to pick up our dinner. And he says, what are you talking about? I said, come on, jump in the car, come with me. He got a tour. And not only did he get a tour, he bought his dinner too, word of mouth. I guarantee he will tell other people about it. So think about channels as you think about how you structure your business model canvas. Now, the fourth block is relationship. Now, some of you sell direct. So you have a direct relationship with your customers. Some of you sell through distribution. You may never connect with your ultimate customer because somebody's between you and them in the, in the chain of, of delivery. So you need to ask yourself, how does your business acquire, retain, and grow customers? Do you sell direct? Do you sell through distribution? Do you sell online? And what do you do in order to retain them? How do you make sure that you, that you stay top of mind when every single day there's a new competitor out there that is wanting their business? And how do you let them know that you have more than what they've been buying before that they can purchase from you that will grow your business? In understanding the, these elements, you'll then be able to connect with the relationship that you have with them. I had a client many years ago who had lost a significant number of customers. He hired us to determine why. So we went out and interviewed all the customers who had left them in the last two years. And we found that it was not price. It was not quality. It was not the work they did, the workmanship, it was the fact that they felt taken for granted. That the only time the supplier ever communicated with them was it's time to go to the next show when they needed exhibit materials. 
So you need to understand how much your customers want to be connected to interact with you and how much you need to know in the way of interaction to know what their next needs may be. So when you do this, you need to do, you do this because it costs five to 10 times more to buy, find a new customer than it does to continue selling with an existing customer. You need to know how they feel about you and what they'll say to other people about the service that you have performed. So your value proposition and your customer relationship and how you connect with your customers are very closely aligned because the need, want, and desire that they have can be fulfilled in a number of different ways. Well, ways has casual users with their free app. Ways never doesn't know, I don't think, when I'm using it. Maybe they do. And the community support by game mechanics, as well as advertisers and their expectations. So they need to think in terms of multiple levels. My wife and I owned a trade show marketing company, and we had multiple levels of buyers. One level was the exhibit manager. One level was the vice president of sales and marketing. And a third level was the owner or president of the, of the company, the, the exhibitor. That's on the exhibit side. Each one of them had a different relationship. And, a, and, a, and connections were very different. So we had to think in terms of how do we construct these relationships to have not only new business, but continuing business and referrals. Now, when we move from the inside to the outside to the inside, we need to ask ourselves, what are the key activities that our value proposition requires? What is it that we need to do in order to operate our businesses successfully? I was working with a client last week and I said, your job for our next meeting is to list every single element of your business that you need to undertake in order to make this business work. So it's everything that your organization does in order to provide that competitive advantage. Whether it be greeting people when they come in the door, have a clerk taking the, uh, taking the order, whether it be people at the loading dock, receiving materials for your inventory or delivering materials, everything, sales, marketing, accounting, everything, human resources, because you need to know what the depth and breadth of your business model is so that you know exactly how to make it work. And those of you in business know you can't do it all. So we need to lay out everything that needs to be done in order to make it work, in order to decide who is going to do this. Well, the activities of an organization start and finish with sales and marketing, positioning yourself in the mind of buyers and getting them to say yes. It also includes distribution. How are you going to get your products from point A to point B? How are you going to get it from your location to where it needs to be? Delivery, follow-up. How are you going to follow up with your customers? And how many of you do follow up? We used to send a postcard to our customers after every show, thanking them for their business and looking forward to working with them in the future. Handwritten. That note positioned us differently than our competition. And if you're in manufacturing, what are all the steps of manufacturing? So when you think in terms of customer satisfaction, when you think in terms of customer relationships or supply chain management, inventory, these are all the activities you need to think about in order to make this model work. Because you're going to need to look at who's going to do what. Well, in ways, they have new markets. They have R&D for their software. They have sales to their advertisers. And they have curating data that they're receiving about locations 
where they where you are driving. Now, once we know what it is that we'll, we need to do in order to operate our business, we need to ask ourselves, who are our partners in accomplishing these tasks? Who are our suppliers? And what are the resources that we're going to require from these partners? So let's take a little deeper look. Our partners could be our bank. Johnny Long may be your partner to provide you working capital or provide you a loan to expand your business or to buy capital equipment for your business. Your suppliers may be your partners because they provide you credit for the materials you need in order to sell. Your shippers. Now, some of these may be strategic alliances. We provided training and measurement for exhibitors. Our strategic alliances were made with exhibit builders. When they sold a new exhibit, we offered training and measurement. They were joint ventures. We work with marketing businesses, marketing organizations. There might be just a supply buyer supplier relationship. It may be you partner with competitors because you offer something that they don't offer completely. We had a, a competitor that we actually worked with and provided the measurement and non-competitors. So you want to think about people you can partner with. And partnering meaning that you can optimize both organizations. Well, key partners for Waze are the big advertisers, the gas chains, and the community leaders. It helps them achieve their key activities. And you think about your partners and your suppliers, because what you want to do is ask, who are your partners and suppliers, and what key resources do you require from them? When we had our business, the one thing we did not do is our marketing collateral material. Now today, most of the collateral material is digital. But we had a, par a partner who for 27 years developed our collateral material. Those of you who know me uh, know that I'm very linear. I take notes, Roman numeral one, A, B, Roman numeral two. But when it comes to laying it out creatively, my wife, my, who was my partner, was very creative, and she worked with our designer to lay it out. So you need to ask yourself, what kind of partners do you need in order to make this work? And resources. What are the resources that it takes in order to make the business model work? When you think about it, they come in a variety of different categories, financial, physical plant, logistics, and intellectual property. And what do you specifically need from them? Sometimes it's a human resource. So what you wanna do is think in terms of specialists that you may need in order to work with you. When we think about resources, we think about human resources that provide knowledge, skills, abilities, talents. We had a training business and we wanted to migrate it into a measurement business. So we went and found a resource that could help us develop the measurement tools that we needed in order to make that a business segment for us. It may be financial, as I talked about, maybe startup, financing, maybe operating financing, and maybe expansion. You want to build an extension to your building. You want, to add, you want to buy the condo next to you so you can expand your retail business. Maybe physical. Location and equipment. I'm working with a restaurateur right now who bought a business but needs additional refrigeration in order to undertake the kind of servicing 
he wants versus the restaurant that he bought. Or maybe intellectual property or trademarks, patents, trade secrets, the intellectual side. We need to think about the resources that we need in order to make this model successful. Well, Waze, when they looked at resources, software, algorithms, developers, maps, IT infrastructure, mindshare, those are the resources that they need in order to make the model work. Now, the thing that's really ingenious about what Strategizer did in developing Business Model Canvas is that you can validate these elements. So when you think about you, what you've decided or assumed your value proposition is, you've assumed who your customer segments are, you've assumed you know how these customer segments get their information, you can go validate that. You can go out and ask your target customers, are your needs, want, and desires those that we can provide to meet the issues that you are facing? And where do you get your information? You can validate it. And if it's not correct after talking to a number of people, you can line it out and add. Tomorrow, I'm meeting with a client who has sent her survey. It's an assessment survey to seven potential clients to evaluate it. She's identified the clients, the size of the practice that she's focusing on. And when she gets that back, she will be able to go through a value proposition and determine whether it, those, val those assumptions she made are value, val valid. So you want to do this before you take the next step after resources. And that is the financial side. What are the costs that are inherent in this model? What is it going to take to open the door? What's it going to take to expand the business? What are the fixed and variable expenses? What are the costs involved? What are your economies of scale? Knowing your, your cash flow. So understanding the financial side is critical in the next step. So what you want to do is look at the cost structure as it's associated with the activities that you've identified so that you can determine the financial side and the viability of the business model. So when you look at Waze, they looked at R&D software, they looked at IT infrastructure maps and selling to advertisers as their costs. And then look at your revenue streams. Where's the money going to come from? Where is the, are the sales going to come from? Now, many of you will have more than one revenue stream. We had revenue from our customers who bought our training programs. There were live training programs and online training programs. There were video training programs as subs to training. Another revenue stream was measurement. And we had qualitative measurement, we had quantitative measurement. And then a third segment was software and product because we sold measurement software and training products. So what you want to do is think in terms of what are your revenue streams? Where's the fund, where are the funds going to come from? And in this process, you need to look at what value will your customers pay for? And are they willing to pay for it? A lot of people come and we work with and they think they have a fantastic idea and it looks great until they talk to potential customers about their willingness to pay for the value. You also have to look at your revenue streams as what's the frequency of purchase? I just contracted with a landscaper. He has going to do seven treatments from now until November. It's recurring. When we sold a training program, it maybe was once a year. They may have bought some product along the way, but we kept in contact with them so that they, if they decided they were going to do an event as well as a trade show, they knew we were there. So understanding the revenue side 
is critical at this point. So you can look at the revenue and then look at the cost structure and say, do I have a viable enterprise that will generate positive cash flow and profit? When you look at ways, it's advertising by roadside businesses and paper impressions. Now, we have found after using this business model canvas the last five or six years, there's one area that is left off and that's competition. So you need to add a 10th block or at least a page because as Sun Tzu said in 600 BC, those who do not understand the competition are surely going to lose the battle. You need to understand not only who they are, where they are, what they're offering, and what they are offering that is different than you, because your business model has to have a differentiator. It has to show that buyer why they should change from whomever they're buying today or whomever they're getting their needs fulfilled to you. You need to understand how do they go to market? What do they use in order to attract customers? What's their brand represent? So understanding this allows you to make strategic decisions about product offering, about pricing, about promotion, about how you're going to deliver the need, want, or desire of your customers. Now, I want you to think just a little bit differently. Merrimack Valley score designed an advanced business model canvas. And they looked at it a little bit differently. They took the nine blocks and resorted them. So as we close, I want you to think about the four areas of infrastructure value, business value and customer value, as well as customer infrastructure. Your business infrastructure is your, are your key partners, your key activities and your key resources. Your business value is your cost structure and your revenue streams. Your customer value is your value proposition and your customer infrastructure are who they are, how you reach them and what's the relationship. Now, when you look at it this way, it puts it really into perspective because here you are meeting the needs through a business model that focuses on needs, wants, and desires, not necessarily on things. I'm a big fan of Churchill and some of the things he said. He said, they who fail to plan, plan to fail. Now, it doesn't make a difference if it's a one-page plan, a 10-page plan, whatever. Thinking through why you're doing what you're doing, what you're going to do in order to meet the needs, wants, and desires of your customer segment, and how you're going to do it, what are the tools that you're going to need in order to accomplish it, is critical. Those people that just jump into it and start a business without thinking through it are likely going to fail because they're not going to generate the revenue streams in order to generate the cash flow to generate the profits. I'm going to be sending this PowerPoint to Teresa, and she's going to send it out to you because in the appendix is a traditional business plan outline everything you need to know in order to develop a business plan, if that's something that you think you need. So why don't I stop? And uh, Teresa, do you have any questions or comments that have come through? Yeah, I do have a great question. Um, and, I, and while I read that out, I want to encourage you all to please put any questions to Mark or to East Cambridge Bank into the Q&A, and we will get those answered for you. Um, Mark, um, I have a question is, uh, if a business I'm starting provides a service and also involves selling a product, would you use just one of these tables or is it wise to break that into two? An example might be um, that you have a lawn service and that you also sell fertilizer. I would do two. Um, and then you can merge them. But 
you need to think through especially the offer and the customer segments because they're they may be different um but when you think through your business plan what you have are two revenue streams but i would start off especially in the first three blocks with the value proposition the customer segments and the channels because they may be different. People may buy fertilizer because they still want to do it themselves versus the lawn service. So I would do it and then merge them uh, together. So you only are dealing with one plan as you launch your business. Okay. Uh, is there a standard percentage amount for advertising that the, a new bez, business owner should expect to spend to get the word out? <laughs> You, ever, you hate to hear the answer, depends. It's a function of the business. Uh, it's a function of the comp competitive environment that you're in. It's a function of your target audience and how willing they are to um, in, embrace a new offering. Uh, I would say that uh, you're looking at, at a, a promotion budget, probably of five to 10% of uh, your expected sales. Uh, but it's a, really a function of those elements to determine how much you're going to do and how you're going to do it uh, and uh, who you're trying to reach. I know that's not a very specific answer, but it takes understanding those elements in order to determine uh, a budget. Uh, realizing that many people are on social media, uh, you can do it uh, fairly nominally, especially if you post and boost, uh, but uh, you, you, you need to just understand those elements before you uh, just determine how much you're going to have to invest. Teresa, if I can jump on that, this is Margaret, given this is my background in terms of marketing. I agree with Mark. And what I would say to the person who answered the question is that your total marketing budget should be between seven to 10% of your first year's revenue. Um, which in the first years obviously should be on the higher side as a percentage and as you go through time, hopefully lower. But that's your total marketing budget. That's not direct spend for advertising. So Mark's right, it depends. Um, but there are, there are good guidelines. There are also good guidelines by industry. So that, that answer also depends consumer product versus, um, for example, um, for uh, different products versus B2B. And again, that's something um, one of us could help you with if that's, if that's of interest to you. But, you know, for sure, put in maybe 78% as a total. Um, I do not see any other questions. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank everyone for attending. You'll get some follow-up from us. And please let um, either East Cambridge Savings Bank know if they can help you with regards to needing that financial partnering that Mark was talking about, or please reach out. I, I believe um, Teresa put in the chat all the connections to the different score chapters that were listed on one of the first slides, but please reach out to us and let us know if there's anything that we can do to help you with your business. No question is too small or too large, and um, we're happy to do that. And again, as we said, everything that we do at SCORE is uh, free and, um, and confidential, and we're happy and delighted to help any of you. Thank you, from, thank, um, you. thank you to SCORE and to Mark for a wonderful, rich program from East Cambridge Savings Bank. We're here if you wanna just even consult with us. Great, thank you everybody. Have a great Thanks week. very much. Thanks everybody. Bye. Take good care. Bye.